Para empezar el día de hoy, tenemos invitado a Jeffrey Schumacher, que ha estado trabajando en la intersección entre arquitectura, diseño urbano y planificación durante más de 25 años, tanto en el sector público como en el sector privado y en ciudades de todo el mundo. Trabajó en la ciudad de Nueva York como diseñador urbano jefe y director de diseño urbano y ocupó cargos de liderazgo en algunas de las principales firmas de arquitectura, planificación urbana y diseño de mundo. Jeffrey es actualmente presidente de Urban Scapes, una consultora internacional de planificación y diseño urbano que fundó en 2002. Tomando un enfoque basado en el lugar para su trabajo, Jeffrey está ayudando a comunidades, firmas de arquitectura y planificación, instituciones privadas sin ánimo de lucro, pueblos y ciudades, a crear mejores lugares para vivir, trabajar, estudiar y jugar. Jeffrey brinda, brinda una gama completa de servicios de diseño urbano, planificación e investigación hasta el enlace con las agencias de la ciudad y el asesoramiento a los clientes sobre la estrategia y las aprobaciones públicas. A nivel mundial, Jeffrey se desempeña como asesor experto de ONU Habitat en la implementación de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible. Participó en dos paneles de expertos recientemente en Sevilla y Madrid y está trabajando con ciudades de todo el mundo para desarrollar la capacidad interna de diseño urbano más recientemente en Pretoria, Sudáfrica y Seúl, Corea del Sur. Jeffrey tiene dos másters en Arquitectura, Planificación y Diseño Urbano del MIT, del Massachusetts Institute of Technology, y una licenciatura en Arquitectura con honores en la Universidad de Syracuse. Recibió el Premio de Arquitectura Pública de American Institute of Architects de Nueva York y el Premio Mike Webb del Departamento de Planificación Urbana, ambos reconociendo la excelencia en el diseño urbano en el ámbito público. Jeffrey enseña y da conferencias con frecuencia y actualmente es profesor adjunto de Diseño y Planificación Urbana en la Universidad de Columbia, Nueva York y en el Programa de Arquitectura de Syracuse en Nueva York. Bienvenido, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot of slides to get through, so let me just apologize right off the bat. Uh, I'm going to be moving fairly quickly, uh, but uh, um, uh, anyway, uh, hopefully the translation can, uh, can keep up. So how do I advance here? Um, so by way of quick introduction, I, I, <clears throat> it sounds like I've already been introduced, but Um, I grew up in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York. Uh, it's a place that gets a lot of snow. Uh, they're actually supposed to get over six feet, six feet, so I'm six foot five, so like this much snow by Sunday. Um, so it's very snowy, quiet part of New York. Not at all what you think of when you think of New York City, which is in the opposite corner of the state. But long story short, uh, ended up uh, working as the, the chief urban designer for the, for the city of New York. Um, along the way, worked for, I think, every three-letter architecture planning firm in New York City. Also worked for, for three years at, at MIT after I graduated there. Um, but I think you'll see a sort of a theme comes through my work. Um, the focus is always on the public realm. Uh, public space, placemaking. Uh, this is just a sampling of some of the projects I've worked on uh, at these various firms in the private sector. Uh, and then uh, also I worked for the city of New York for, for a total of 10 years, uh, mostly under Mayor Bloomberg um, and Commissioner Amanda Burton. She was the head of planning at that time. It was in Jeanette Sadek Khan. Some of these names you might recognize. She was uh, transportation. It was an amazing time in the city of New York. Uh, hopefully we'll get back there. We're, we're kind of drifted away from it. But I also do a lot of, my, my background is really in art. I started out doing a lot of art. Uh, and that sort of led me to architecture, which led me to city planning. And I never thought that I would actually be doing a lot of freehand sketching. Uh, these are all projects under the Bloomberg administration. And now I sort of, I teach, I do research, uh, I travel, uh, and I just sort of share, you know, what I've learned uh, over the years. And I have a small consulting practice uh, as well. So, um, Justin Moore, who I, I believe was in the first 
uh, gathering. Uh, he and I are good friends, uh, and so he uh, mentioned, uh, introduced me to Jim, and and, um, and I was sort of at first like, well, what is Manzarote going to learn from New York City? You know, I mean, it just seems, you know, but, and then we were talking like, well, New York is ultimately a city of islands. You know, I mean, uh, you know, so there is there is some kind of similar background. I mean, this is kind of the image I think most people think of when they think of New York. You know, our our midtown skyline, or maybe you think of Times Square, um, or maybe you think of Central Park, uh, you know, and, and more recently, and this is a project that I worked on on the planning side under Bloomberg, was the creation of the High Line. Uh, and it's a part of a larger sort of neighborhood uh, initiative called the West Chelsea Special District. Um, you know, great project. But, you know, when we zoom out, we do realize that, you know, New York is this collection of islands where, you know, you have sort of, um, where's my pointer, is it this thing? You know, of course, Manhattan, which, oh, oh, hold on, go back, go back. You know, Man Manhattan sort of, uh, you know, at the very center. But then we have the Bronx, we have Queens, we have Brooklyn, and we have Staten Island. It's the five boroughs that make up the city of New York. And then uh, we have, you know, 500 plus Miles of waterfront, um, so it's it, it's very much a kind of collection of islands with a lot of water. So this is also New York City. You know, this is not an image that comes to mind, I think, for, for most people. But actually, much of our outer boroughs is a uh, very similar scale to this. A lot of sort of you know it used to be summer beach, you know bungalow beachfront communities that are now kind of permanent housing for for many residents. Uh, and when we had Hurricane Sandy. Uh, these, these, these neighborhoods were on the front lines of, of uh, and continue to be on the front lines of climate change. So a lot of our work has been focused in really at this scale of, of neighborhood and not so much, uh, I mean, in addition to uh, the kind of Manhattan skyscraper scale. Uh, this is a, used to be a garbage, garbage dump uh, in Staten Island. Uh, it's called Fresh Kills. Uh, this is one of the early Bloomberg projects, was to cap the garbage, and, and gradually over time, it's, it's turned into a pretty amazing uh, uh, public green space. Uh, there's also, I wanted to bring in, there's this, this guy called Eric Sanderson. Um, he's uh, really a gift for New York. Uh, he's a, kind of an environmentalist, but he wrote this book called Manhattan, which uh, Really traced the history of the natural, the natural history of New York City, starting with Manhattan, uh, and he's been able to recreate what the island looked like before Henry Hudson, you know, brought in. And we, we saw the, the development of Manhattan, what we what we know of it today. This incredibly biodiverse, rich island, which is why it became so significant for the Lenape Native Americans, and why this was such an important site. Uh, so he's really served to remind us, and we've collaborated over the years to remind the city of what our past was before humans came in and you know created what we what we created. Uh, um, but I'll spend most of my time really talking about uh, in 2007 is when I joined the, the city of New York. Mayor Bloomberg uh, was mayor, obviously. Uh, he, it was also that year that he issued uh, Plan YC. Uh, which was really the kind of first comprehensive plan for, for the city of New York, acknowledging that the city was to grow by a million people by the year 2030, but sort of laying out a plan to do it in a way that could make the city better, uh, more sustainable, really kind of the first conversations around sustainability in a serious way in New York City really started at this point. Um, and through Bloomberg, through Amanda Burden, uh, there was a kind of recreation of an office that once existed uh, back under Mayor Lindsay back in the 1960s. And then it was called the Urban Design Group. We sort of created a new office called the Urban Design Office, essentially the same thing, sitting within the Department of City Planning. But all of us were architects, were designers, were planners. Um, all of us kind of brought our private sector experience uh, to this group, and it was a kind of design office within, within city government. And, and very much supported by, by the mayor uh, and the commissioner. And it's sort of, you know, we always sort of, <clears throat> pretty obvious, but sometimes we have to remind ourselves that cities really are about people. Uh, you know, and New York is one of these incredibly diverse 
cities. You know, we have populations from all over the world, and you know, how do we celebrate that? You know, as we as we work uh, throughout the city, and this really means getting on the ground. So you'll see we do a lot of kind of perspective views from the person's point of view, walking down the street to be able to show people from their from their perspective what the impacts would be. You know, so Times Square, um, just everyday experiences. You know, walking around the city. Uh, I love this picture that one of my colleagues took of the High Line, you know, as a place to gather away from cars. This was really the kind of early days yet of really thinking about our streets, not just for cars, but for, for people. But the High Line, because it's lifted up, was a, was a real opportunity to, to get that experience. Places for protest. This was a time when Trump became president, so you can imagine there was a lot of protesting going on in New York uh, and continues to this day. And then we added a lot of new parks. Um, you know, one thing, even to this day, people think, well, New York City is done. There's no more space for any, anything, uh, which is not true. You know, when you, again, I think when you get on the ground, you start to realize this, for example, is Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, this was a formerly industrial space that was inaccessible. You could not actually get to the waterfront. And much of New York's waterfront was the place of industry. So gradually over time, uh, and I think one of the great uh, legacies of Bloomberg was reconnecting the city to its waterfront. Um, but again, so my focus and the focus of the urban design group is really what, looking at the public realm. And how we define that, again, looking at our streets, not just for cars, but for, for pedestrians, for bicyclists. Um, you can see my hand here, you know, there's a lot of the, the underlying sketches that we use to communicate internally and also to the public. Um, this is <clears throat> Uh, Vanderbilt Avenue, right next to Grand Central Terminal, uh, which was just a typical street with lots of cars. Uh, and so the plan was to close that off uh, for a great pedestrian plaza. This is the North Shore of Staten Island. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, again, the sort of legacy industry uh, and how we can connect people, keep the industry, but kind of let people come into it to see it. We have a lot of privately owned public spaces coming out of our 1961 zoning in the city, which gave developers a bonus for, for creating these spaces. Um, looking at our infrastructure, often the spaces underneath our elevated infrastructure. Um, we have this legacy of Robert Moses, Jane Jacobs, the great battle in New York of, of these highways that often split neighborhoods apart. So we wanted to look at working with our Department of Transportation, created a program called Under the Elevated, which looks at all the spaces underneath uh, 700 miles or so of, of infrastructure as a way to kind of stitch neighborhoods back together. Um, you know, in, in New York, you know, we, I think everywhere there's always this debate between the public versus private, and you know, I think New York City has kind of mastered uh, you know, how to work with the private development community to to get you know some would say extract. <laughs> Uh, but how do we leverage private development to, to make the city better for, for the public? Um, this is an example called Domino Park. This is a privately owned, privately designed, privately managed public space. It's open 24-7. It's part of the city's public space network, um, but it is completely privately uh, owned and managed. Um, we can get into that. There's, it, there's a lot of implications from the design side for that. You can actually do more because the private developer is maintaining it that you can't do if it's a sort of public parks uh, management. Um, and so I'm going to pick up the pace because I have a lot of slides, as I said. Uh, so, so it's through this work, um, through this 10 years, uh, we kind of developed this, uh, a set of very simple principles that we apply to our work uh, everywhere. Um, Really, first, creating a sense of place. You know, a lot of places already have a sense, but some might need to be enhanced. Some places really don't. Uh, so, place making is, is sort of a key component of our work. This example here is uh, Coney Island, uh, which is uh, kind of a, a very old amusement park, one of the first amusement parks in, in the United States, uh, accessible by the subway. You know, this was really at a time. This was in the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, at a time when most people could not afford to fly, uh, you know, or you didn't have the option to fly. 
So really having access to the beach and to the waterfront uh, was, you know, by subway was, was really important. And there are a few sort of iconic landmark landmarks um, that uh, still existed, but, uh, you know, long story short, this neighborhood was, you know, saw some pretty tough times over the years. It was, uh, there were fires, there were Robert Moses, uh, notoriously hated Coney Island, so he put a lot of public housing there and demolished uh, a lot of the amusements. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, so there's quite a quite a long history, um, uh, and so this was one of the early projects that uh, that Bloomer led was how do we kind of bring back the the, the grandeur of, of the city's first amusement park. This is an image from 1910. This is really the kind of heyday of Coney Island. You know, uh, and you can imagine this is one of the only pedestrian streets in the city of New York. In anywhere, uh, and this, this sort of amazing uh, street. So, you know, as urban designers, we wanted to kind of understand the past to inform the future. What are the kind of dimensions that are, that are important for us? Um, this is what it looked like when we started that same street, same view, when we started our, our work there. Um, you know, you can see a lot of lawyered up uh, retail. Uh, much of the site was demolished. Um, you know, so it's certainly, but you can still see the cyclone, the roller coaster in the back, and the wonder wheel. These are sort of, these are landmarks now that are protected, uh, uh, so they're not going anywhere. But so through this process of sketching, working very closely with our zoning division, which sat right next to us in the urban design group, you know, sort of thinking about what is a possible future. You know, this is where the kind of place making aspect comes in. You know. Uh, it's not just the dimension, but it's sort of, you know, making sure that we create the framework for all of this crazy stuff that Coney Island is famous for, that it can happen uh, in the future. So, so these are some of the sketches that, that I produced, um, again, originally meant for just internal uh, discussion, uh, but then we ended up going out to the public with the freehand sketches. This is after we paid a lot of money and got some very fancy renderings, uh, but they just didn't communicate the same way. Because as urban designers, you know, again, it's about creating a place, a sense of place. We're not the architects, we're not the landscape architects, we're creating a, a possible future, you know. And in some ways, a sketch communicates that best, because this is going through a public process. We want people to feel like this is not a finished product, this is a process that we want you to be a part of. And so, you know, this is like a dream project for me to imagine like what the future of Coney Island could be. Uh, you know, literally the sky's the limit if you do kind of, uh, uh, if you have some sort of amusement use within. Each site is a very mixed use site. You can have hotel, you can have uh, restaurants, uh, indoor amusements. And then a certain component would be what we call outdoor amusements, um, which is a lot of what we have there today. Um, the second kind of main point is, is equity, something we, we talk a lot more about. Uh, I think everywhere, uh, which is which is good, uh, making sure that the city is open and accessible to everyone. The example I use here is really under Jeanette Sadek Khan's leadership uh, of really opening up the city to bicyclists and creating hundreds of miles of bike lanes in a city that uh, was not very bike friendly, uh, to say the least. Uh, but it has gradually, over time, become you know. Uh, Probably no surprises to, to you all if you provide the infrastructure that's safe for people to go around uh, and to make uh, more and more people will start getting around by bike. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a huge increase in the numbers of people that are commuting by, by bike uh, throughout the city. But even in our industrial areas, thinking about we have a lot of pedestrians walking through them, something as simple as a crosswalk, you'd be surprised. Many of our streets don't, don't actually have clear markations of where pedestrians should go, where cars should slow down. So, so some of these obvious things, but, uh, but really important uh, for all of our neighborhoods. And then even though, you know, as urban designers, we often zoom out, but we also have to zoom in, you know, and think about the scale of the kind of the human scale. This was a sketch of the High Line. This was a unique condition of the High Line that was running parallel to a street, the 30th Street, and thinking about um, you know, how the High Line meets the street and what is the kind of rhythm that that structure created that we kind of start to infill with, with, you know, artists, studios, restaurants, and other things that can help to activate the street 
and bring the life of the High Line down, down to the street. And then ultimately it's about comfort. It's about making the city feel comfortable for people. Um, you know, that it's safe, that it's a place that people want to spend time in. And the example I'll give here is we, we did a whole series of, uh, actually uh, quite a, a large partnership that our health department led. Uh, it brought us in from city planning, brought in transportation, looking at what we call active, active design. Uh, and, and really thinking about the role that our physical environments play in a person's public health. You know, we have a huge responsibility as planners, as architects, to design our cities, our neighborhoods, to encourage people to walk, to encourage people to take a bike, to get them out of their car, you know, to, to, to bring back the stairs, for example. You know, we've, we've kind of lost the significance of stairs and kind of as a kind of grand entrance. Um, you know, still providing elevators for, for ADA access, but, um, you know, so there was a whole series of things, and then we did a whole subsequent study on just the sidewalk, and the importance of the sidewalk. The sidewalk is the most important public space in any city. I will just say that right now, and you'll, you'll hear that a lot. It's sort of, and, and so we sort of conceive the sidewalk as a three-dimensional experience, which it is. You know, we often think of just the ground plane of the sidewalk, right, when we, when we think of the sidewalk. But it's the ground plane, it's also the street side, you know, do we have street trees? What do you see across the street? Do you have parked cars, parallel park, that might provide a buffer between you, pedestrian, and moving cars? When you look up, do you have, you know, if it's hot, sunny, do you have a tree that provides shade? Do you have a canopy that comes out from the building? And I would argue the most important plane for the sidewalk experience is actually the architecture. And as city planning, we actually have a lot to say about this through our zoning regulations, through levels of transparency, how much glass do you have, what kinds of uses are required on the ground floor, are we what we call active uses, are they restaurants, are they cafes, are they things that create this sort of active experience that you can engage with, do you have signage, and if so, what kind does it come out, is it more pedestrian focused signage, or is it car focused? Um, you know, so there, there's, a, there's a lot in here, and all of that coming together to create that sort of three-dimensional experience of, of the sidewalk. Um, but again, all of this is under the umbrella of public health. And it was a way for us as designers to talk about design in a way that people, most people in communities care more about, frankly, than design is public health. You know, so it gave us an opportunity to kind of reframe the conversation. Um, I'm going to move quickly through here, but then we set up a whole series of steps. You know, again, this is really meant for public consumption, I think, as, as architects, as planners. Uh, you know, this is pretty obvious, but um, first and foremost, get to know a place before you do anything to it. You know, it seems pretty obvious. Don't just do this Google Street View, but actually go and visit, walk it, hear it, smell it, you know, and, and get that, that full experience. Uh, and we've had many interns over the years, so we often do particularly in the summer, we'll go and, and just sketch a neighborhood. Uh, and and that, again, that process of sketching, it's a, a bit of a dying art. I don't know how it is over here, but certainly in the U.S. and in New York, and certainly at Columbia, you know, where everyone immediately goes into the computer. You know, I, I, I try to really force the, the sort of the process of sketching and thinking through, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, although I sketch on my iPad now, I don't actually sketch on paper, but, but still, it's still it's sort of, kind of a, a different way of thinking. Um, surveying, measuring, uh, a lot of our work is, is coming up with creative ways of engaging the public, to bring the public into the process, uh, whether it's, it's in real time sketching over photographs of a neighborhood. Uh, this is Eric Gregory, who's also a GSAP Columbia guy, who's now the, the chief urban designer, um, uh, sketching away at a public meeting, sort of giving kind of a real time feedback loop. Um, using models, like a physical model, you know, again, it's a bit old school, but people love like that, that uh, to be able to kind of see it from a different perspective. Engage children as much as you can, like Leg Legos are amazing, you know, it's an amazing engagement tool. Uh, just put some Legos out and suddenly, you know, you can see kids come from, from everywhere. Um, I already sort of mentioned this, thinking from different 
scales, different perspectives. You know, it's, it's you know, urban design. We often do the aerial view of a neighbor. This is uh, our uh, Queens waterfront, which is seeing a lot of development pressures. Uh, but then get, getting on the ground as well, and sort of understanding what that experience is on the ground. Uh, and in this, in this case, we were trying to mix industry in with residential and, and, and kind of erasing zoning in a way, and going back to like the 1916 New York City zoning, which uh, uh, you know, a lot of these uses were pulled apart in a, in a way that was really kind of counterproductive. But industry has changed. You know, industry is very clean now, and a lot of people actually like living close to where they work, or, you know, so there's opportunities now to really kind of rethink how we mix uses uh, in a way that, that we haven't necessarily been thinking. You know, think long term. This is work that we did before, two years before Sandy hit uh, New York City, and really thinking, working with our Office of Emergency Management, OEM, thinking about what, you know, starting to elevate our buildings that are, um, you know, many of those sort of bungalow houses that I showed in the early pictures on the front lines, again, of, of climate change and hurricane force winds and waves. Uh, you have a lot of very small houses uh, and thinking of how we can uh, make them more resilient. Visualizing what that impact, again, this is before Sandy, um, but we, we developed a, a kind of stackable, more urban temporary housing unit. This was after Katrina hit New Orleans, and you know you may have seen some of the images of all the uh, the tents, some tent cities that were created in these vast parking lots. Well, we knew in New York we don't have that kind of space, so we had to develop a much more urban approach to temporary housing, and so we developed this kind of stackable unit system. And then long term, thinking about what should the waterfront be, you know, really letting water. I mean, it seems counterintuitive. Certainly, in the context of, of hurricane force winds to bring water in, but it's actually a much more resilient waterfront. You know, sort of nature based solutions that, thankfully, even at the federal level in the United States, um, they're starting to talk about nature based solutions. You know, don't just put a bunch of concrete, but uh, let nature do some of the work for you. Again, kind of going back to the Eric Sanderson Manhattan days of, you know, what our waterfront looked like before we came in. Uh, and then questioning the status quo, I think that's always the, the important role that, frankly, all of us should play, but certainly we felt as, as designers that that was a role that we played within city planning. Uh, and in this case, the example I'll show is, uh, this was a, a design competition, again, under, under Bloomberg, uh, where we wanted to encourage and allow smaller units because what we found is that our zoning actually prohibits this kind of smaller unit option. Uh, we had a minimum square foot requirement for our residential of about 400 square feet, um, uh, and, and which is quite large, you know. And, and uh, so we developed, you know, through a process of kind of sketching through, if we remove the zoning regulation and kept all the other rules in there for quality housing. And other things. You know, we got it down to about a 250 square foot, so almost half, uh, you know, and still providing a, a nice kitchen, fully accessible bathroom, uh, and the, the, probably the greatest flexibility is in the, the living space where you can, by day, you can have your sofa, and at night, you can have your bed, you know, and there's, there's a lot of really interesting furniture we partner with furniture companies to kind of show, you know, how you can really transform. Uh, and then for the press release, you know, we often work with the, the local chapter of the American Institute of Architects, the New York chapter. They have the Center for Architecture in the village, and they have this great space, and we actually take down uh, in full scale one of these units, uh, you know, just to, to be able to show to the public what this feels like, you know, because we knew we were going to get the question, well, aren't we just going back to the overcrowding tenement days, you know, before zoning was put in place. And we can say, well, actually, if you looked at this, that kitchen, you know, it's actually a pretty nice kitchen. You know, and, and, and I, I think the, the takeaway here is that if, if designed properly, if designed, period, uh, small spaces can be quite, quite livable. We looked to other cities. Uh, Tokyo, certainly, is quite, quite famous for five minutes. Oh, boy. 
Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm just going to kind of click through. But, so we let the public in. There's Bloomberg and Amanda kind of walk through the space. And, you know, we got a lot of interesting press kind of making fun of the whole thing. There's our little plan there with, you know, with some celebrities on the cover. Um, this, I thought, was the most flattering piece of press that we got. It was sort of poking fun at the whole idea, you know, your, your bathtub is your bed, the window from jumping out of, you know, it's a, uh, New Yorkers like to, to... So I'm just, and we ended up selecting uh, an architect, so Brooklyn-based firm, uh, and built this because it was meant to be a pilot, a real pilot. It's another takeaway, pilot. Pilots are wonderful. You know, it's a great way to just test something out, and you can say, look, if it doesn't work, we'll never do it again. But um, for, for the public, at least, it, it sort of takes some of the pressure off. So, big takeaway, Bloomberg, I think we should thank, in many ways, for New York City rediscovering its waterfront. Um, and just some images, you know, getting to the water, getting under the water, coming out in public spaces along the water, getting in, you know, I mean, it's still quite polluted, you know, but we do get these very brave individuals who will choose to swim. Um, but we are cleaning it up, you know, in a similar way that maybe the Copenhagen Harbor was once heavily polluted, which is now very swimmable. We're starting to plan for a day when we can actually get into the water. Um, so this is a, a plan that's, that's kind of worked its way through the process. So I'm going to end with kind of a, a project from my private sector experience. I was at BIG, I was their director of planning and design for a couple of years. Um, and I'm just going to kind of quickly click through some of the examples of some of the work that we did in, in, in New York. Brooklyn uh, added a lot of, of density, uh, and particularly in downtown Brooklyn. But we have to work on the public realm aspect. You know, again, those sort of public spaces, the streets, how to make them safer, greener, uh, more walkable. Uh, using color, I think Big is a, is a firm that's quite good at, at sort of illustrating uh, the potential. Uh, using color, there's a whole series of different you know street closures, shared streets, uh, alleyway conversions, uh, and then just some of the before and after of what that look like and the potential of that. Um, again, these are meant to kind of <laughs> get people excited, but I always love this rendering because it's like this little girl is going like, to slam into that brick wall. But, you know, so maybe not the most realistic, but, you know, sort of just, again, the idea of color and, and lighting and plan, the, the, the basic elements are the same universally, you know, kind of bring them together in, in the space. Uh, another project is <clears throat> converting an elevated highway, which is crumbling. Uh, it's quite literally crumbling. Uh, the BQE, Brooklyn Queens Expressway, uh, in its day, quite innovative. It had this triple cantilever with a public park on the roof, the, the Brooklyn Heights Promenade. Um, again, innovative, sort of nice promenade. But quite literally, I think by the year 2026, that they would have to start removing trucks from this highway because it is literally crumbling. So, you know, there, there's a lot of this sort of infrastructure that's been put in place is reading, uh, is realizing sort of the end of life and it creates an opportunity for us to kind of rethink. DOT, the city's transportation, all that came in with a solution that basically destroyed the Brooklyn Promenade, um, which you can imagine that did not go over so well. Uh, people got very upset. Uh, this is when Adams was uh, borough president, he's now mayor of the city. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, we often looked at other cities. San Francisco, they had an earthquake that maybe helped them remove one of their highways. Uh, you know, even in New York City, uh, on the west side, uh, there was a highway removal uh, collapse in this case. Uh, so sometimes nature kind of takes care of things for us uh, in a way. Uh, and then here, looking at just this is an old image of what the Brooklyn Heights uh, waterfront looked like. Um, and so we, we often use this sort of perspective section as a way to illustrate the potential. Brooklyn Ridge Park, the city spent a lot of money creating this new park on the waterfront. And then you still have this sort of elevated highway, lots of noise, pollution. So part of the park design was creating this berm so that you couldn't hear as much of the sound and maybe capture some of the pollution. Um, but what we're saying, well, why don't you just put the highway underground? within that berm, because the berm was really never part of the original plan for the park, and then build over it. 
uh, and have the park now extend all the way from the Brooklyn Promenade all the way down to the waterfront and this sort of seamless connection. Uh, and then you could, you know, you could even tuck in some parking underneath, you know. It's again, so sort of taking that same limited space that we have and being smarter about it is really, I think, that's kind of the lesson here. Just some before and afters, you know, just showing that kind of seamless connection, uh, what that could be, uh, you know, finding the opportunities for bringing nature back into the city. Um, and we got a nice article in the New York Times about it. The city's now looking at the whole thing, uh, not just the Brooklyn Heights portion. So this is just starting its process. And I'm just going to very quickly, I can, if anybody's interested, when I have more time later, I can show you. Uh, we did this sort of Brooklyn Bridge reimagining competition. This was in the height of the pandemic. Um, also when the Black Lives Matter movement was sort of hit, really kind of coming to the fore in New York. Uh, and the Brooklyn Bridge as a sort of great iconic structure was really under pressure. Uh, and a lot of people were sort of questioning, you know, what, what the bridge should be. In its heyday, back when we had streetcars and trains crossing the bridge, we were able to move over 400,000 people across that bridge per day. And then, you know, the story is in many cities, when cars were introduced, a lot of this infrastructure was demolished. And then this is kind of what we have today, a lot of congestion, very inefficient use. So today we have a far less number of people crossing that bridge. So, you know, as designers, we like to show the pictures, but backing up with the numbers also helps in talking about it more from a performance perspective. Um, so we worked with Arab, uh, New York studio, to kind of show that we could actually close the bridge off entirely to cars, and that traffic can shift elsewhere. We also have congestion pricing that's coming into New York, which will hopefully lower the numbers of cars coming in. <laughs> the kind of before and after. Uh, I'm probably over my time now, but uh, again, I can, if anyone's interested, I can certainly share. Well, you'll have this presentation, so you can click through it at your own time. But looking at the opportunities on either end. So the city is moving very slowly in this direction. They've closed off one lane to cars, uh, so we've got a bike, at least a bike lane out of it. And then the last thing I want to just quickly breeze through completely different. Uh, this was an opportunity to create an entirely new city off the coast of Penang in Malaysia. This was an international competition um, that we participated in. We had winning the competition. It was essentially creating a whole series of new islands off the coast, um, which was very controversial. But uh, <clears throat> a lot of this land is protected. Uh, and so, and it's also not ideal for development. And so the, the this was a public-private partnership, and so the, the Penang government really wanted to, to, to and, and also the, the water bay here was, was uh, not ideal, uh, to say the least, through uh, 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 poor development over time. Uh, incredibly biodiverse part of the world. Um, just kind of zooming into it. Uh, there's a lot of engagement with, uh, with people across Penang, across the island, to sort of talk about what could be, as I mentioned, it's a private-public partnership. Uh, this is the site. Uh, these were the islands. Uh, incredibly, you know, really just a rich uh, environment. Uh, and so the, the main challenge that we set for ourselves is how can we create a new city that has biodiversity in nature in the, at the very beginning? Like, how do we make a place that both humans and nature can thrive and live side by side? There's some great kind of historic context. And again, from a kind of performance standpoint, you know, you can start in the upper right hand corner, you can start to see if you measure the, the, uh, the impacts, this kind of, and when you have the opportunity to do this, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you can build into it from the very, very outset, so I'm not gonna go into it, but I just wanted to show some of the images. Um, you know, really kind of breaking down, keep breaking it down, bringing in different, different uses, orienting according to the winds, it's a very humid climate, you know, so again, when you're starting from scratch, there's things that you can do that would be challenging, to say the least, in a place like New York City. Um, you know, I'm really kind of, there's this, this special turtle that we were designing the waterfront around, um, the olive 
well, a 50 sea turtle, uh, so, so we kind of shaped the waterfront. We had a kind of biodiversity expert on the team, an uh, ecologist on the team. Uh, and these are just some of the crazy renderings I'll leave you with. You know, I don't think this is ever going to happen. <laughs> but it was fun. We had fun. Uh, but, you know, I think for me, actually, is the, the existing cities, the existing places are more interesting. They're definitely more challenging to kind of bring, you know, this, some of this thinking into. Um, and, uh, you know, but it's fun to, to imagine the future. So thank you.